Hey, everybody. A few weeks ago, as you know, we launched a spinoff podcast called Voices, and it was previously featured on Outside the Walls, and now it's its own podcast. The latest episode is from Christy Purifoy and her new book called Placemaker, and it's by far one of my favorite episodes of Voices ever. And as a treat to you, we're going to play that episode right here. And then after you listen to it and after you buy Christy's book, then go over to the Voices podcast and hit the subscribe button and also give us a rating and review. We hope that you enjoy this amazing episode. Voices. Despite the romantic histories and evocative names, it isn't easy to spend money and have only flowers to show for it. It isn't like a donation to a charity. It isn't like a deposit in a savings account. A flower isn't even a carrot. I cannot fill my stew pot with flowers. That first winter, the number on our bank statement dwindled with the purchase of each bare root rose and lily bulb, yet I did not have even flowers to show for it. The view from the parlor window remained the same, bleak and brown. But dreams ask for commitment. They require that proverbial running leap. Jonathan and I had smothered the lawn and there could be no going back. In a month or two, cardboard boxes labeled fragile, this side up, and live plants would begin showing up on the porch near the back door. I looked forward to planting antique roses with names like Souvenir de la Malmaison, Sombroy, and Madame Hardy, a white rose with a stunning green button eye that I had ordered from the Antique Rose Emporium. But even if this flower garden dream was one day realized, even if the roses took root and grew, would Jonathan and I say it had been worthwhile? Spring arrives in the garden long before it arrives anywhere else. As soon as the last snow had melted, as soon as the muck began to thaw, we were out in it. Jonathan built, slowly, picket by picket, a fence. Together we marked the paths with twine and a few well-placed stakes. The air was still cold enough to make me wish for fleece-lined gardening gloves. But with freezing hands, I buried lily bulbs and the woody bare roots of roses along the edges of the still theoretical paths. I hoped our measurements would prove themselves true. I hoped they would prove us true. I also tended seedlings in the basement, zinnias in white and salmon pink, cosmos, sweet-scented alyssum, and lace flowers stretched beneath the faux sunlight of fluorescent shop lights. My gardening books talk of plant combinations and color palettes, but it is all so much more uncertain than paint on a canvas or words on a page. With the help of my sister, my father, and many books, I had chosen my varieties with care, but I could not know then that the newly amended soil would be too fertile for cosmos and lace flowers. The cosmos would grow into feathery green monsters, but never bloom and the lace flowers would leap and flower and quickly rot away. I could not know that the salmon pink zinnias would turn out to be more of a garish orange. I could not know that the white zinnias would glow in the evening like moonlight and starlight and magic. We hosted an Easter egg hunt for our neighbors, as we had done every year since our first spring at Maplehurst. Nothing yet grew in the garden, except candy-filled eggs and tiny green boxwood shrubs. Paths were merely the suggestion of rain-sodden string. What is that? my neighbors asked, pointing toward the great brown square. What are you doing? Dreaming, I did not answer them. Hoping, I did not say. That's our new flower garden, I explained with a hearty voice and a trembling smile. Jonathan and I consoled ourselves with every gardener's favorite words. Next year. Next year? Won't this be the perfect spot for an Easter egg hunt? Next year? Won't the roses be beautiful? Next year? Won't we say how glad we are to have done this? The wild thing about next year is that it always does come, and so much more quickly than we ever dare to hope. When you tend gardens and young children, this is both a marvelous and a heartbreaking thing. 
We hosted another Easter egg hunt for our neighbors this spring. This year, toddlers crunched across the garden's gravel paths, scooping up eggs. The window boxes in the potting shed spilled the old-fashioned violets called Johnny Jump Ups in purple, gold, and white. The green boxwoods edged beds that, while still mostly brown and mostly empty, at least looked like what they were. Places where flowers would grow. The wild thing about next year is that it gives and it takes away, but what it gives and what it takes are so often unexpected. This year gave perfectly formed daffodils, despite our strangely warm El Nino winter. This year took the life of Kelly's husband, Sean, in a military helicopter crash off the beautiful blue coast of Oahu. In January, before spring, before the egg hunt with neighbors, I flew with my daughter Lillian to Hawaii. When we boarded the plane, we still hoped that Sean was not dead, but lost. We imagined what was never true. Twelve men together on a life raft. Twelve men heading home from the sea. In April, we buried Sean in Texas prairie soil. In June, I snipped roses and gathered the first lilies with Sean's children, my four nieces and nephews. Every day of her visit at Maplehurst, my youngest niece helped me fill a collection of buckets with weeds. Then we would feed the weeds one by one to the chickens. These eggs will be full of vitamins, we took turns saying to one another. Of course, a flower garden costs so much more than a carton of free-range eggs from the market. There is the money for bare roots and bulbs. There is the time spent pruning and weeding. There is the frustration of watching Japanese beetles devour rosebuds from the inside out. One moment it is Eden, and the next a sudden rainstorm has flattened half of the trumpet lilies. When I count the costs, I begin to doubt. But when I remember my sister taking photographs of the roses in delicate rainbow colors, when I think of my niece pulling green velvet weeds, I say, how glad I am to have made this garden. There are quite a few smaller places within this larger place I call home. There is the squishy sofa in the small sunroom. That is a good place to sit with a book. There is the bench shaded by wild grapevines halfway down the avenue. That is a good place to hide. There is the fenced-in square of the vegetable garden. That is a good place for sneaking the first ripe cherry tomatoes quickly into your mouth. But this summer, the place I love most is the flower garden, with an Amish-made shed for shelter, two benches for rest, and a wild abundance of blooms. The flower garden has grown into a sanctuary. It is a place where peace dwells, the kind of peace that persists regardless of grief or thunderstorms or insects. We made it with our own hands, yet it feels like a gift I did nothing to deserve. Whether I am picking weeds or squashing beetles or cutting a frilly pink dahlia the exact size of young Elsa's head, I keep looking for someone to acknowledge. Of course, a sanctuary is also a good place for prayer. Perhaps that is why, as I work, I do not whistle. I only whisper, thank you. That was an excerpt from Christy Purifoy's book, Placemaker. Christy, what is a placemaker and who are placemakers? For a long time, I was searching for a word that was more spacious than homemaker. A word that had room for the making and tending we do in our homes, but also in our gardens and neighborhoods and cities. I wanted a word with room for men and women, room for those who naturally love hospitality and entertaining and those who prefer to be alone. I wanted a word that included those who work from home, but also those who leave home every day for work. And finally, I wanted a word big enough to embrace all the loves in my life, my love of home and family, my love of gardens and places, and finally, my love for our Creator God, the first placemaker. Who are the placemakers? Everyone who loves some place, everyone who risks their heart and sinks their roots deep, even if they know they'll have to leave that place one day. 
Okay, so each chapter is named after a tree species or a forest. So what role have trees played in your life or in your calling? I've been struggling to put down roots my whole life, but I had a sense when I began this book that I could probably learn a lot from the trees. After all, they are the most rooted of God's creatures, yet in Scripture they also appear to be among the most joyful, clapping their hands, singing their praise. Trees have been important since Eden. After all, that was a garden devoted to trees, more like an arboretum than a rose garden. And trees create a sense of shelter and peace, like few other things on earth. Some people dream of beaches, some dream of mountaintops, but I have always dreamed of the dappled shade beneath a spreading tree. I planted my first tree six years ago, and I will go on planting trees, primarily because I want to cultivate peace. All right, so now the million dollar question, why did you write Placemaker and who did you write it for? I had no interest in writing a straightforward how-to book. I didn't want to tell people about placemaking or why they must embrace this work and this way of life. I wanted to inspire them. I wanted to give every reader, even those who had never given much thought even to the tree growing in their front yard, a chance to see the world with new eyes and to see creation with new eyes. I hope the tree stories I tell, as well as the personal stories, inspire and bring reading pleasure in a way that a more straightforward nonfiction book might not have done. I hope I have made something beautiful. And I hope when someone turns the last page, they rise up, moved to make something beautiful too.